Hi, and welcome to Health Chats with Abington Health. I'm your host, Luann Kahn, and tonight's Health Chat is sponsored by Abington Health in partnership with Philadelphia Magazine. Tonight, we're talking about minimally invasive knee options. We're going to discuss knee pain and how to fix it. What are the medical options? And tonight, we're talking with Dr. Andrew Starr. Dr. Starr is the medical director of Abington Health's Orthopedic and Spine Institute. Hello, Dr. Starr. Uh, Dr. Starr, um, if you could start first by telling us about your background and your experience. All right, we're having a problem right now, so while we fix that problem, let me just remind you that you've, if you've already submitted questions, we're going to include your questions uh, in our conversation tonight. And I'd also like to remind you that if during our chat you think of something that you want to ask us, all you have to do is write in that text box underneath the video, and then we'll, we'll include your question in our discussion. I also want to encourage you, uh, if you want to share this with friends, you copy the link and you can paste it into uh, email, Twitter, Facebook, so that friends can join us. Okay, I think that we are ready. Dr. Starr? Yes, can you ah, hear me now? No, so tell us about your background and what we're talking about tonight. Okay, well I'm an orthopedic surgeon through Abington Health, which is Abington Memorial Hospital and Abington Lansdale. Uh, I've been there for about 28 years and I specialize in joint replacements, so I do knee and hip replacements every day, every week. All right, so I know a lot of people have asked questions and I thought maybe we should get right to it. This is um, someone, and again I want to tell you if you want to ask a question that's confidential. This is someone who says, I exercise six days a week and my knees, especially my left, she says, I feel it. I know I should go to the doctor, but I don't want to hear that I have to slow down. Understood. Is exercising with some knee pain better than not exercising at all at 42 years old? Well, great. I'm glad you gave me the age. So we're dealing with somebody in their 40s who may be experiencing some joint pain maybe for the first time in their lives. And the, the idea that it's no pain, no gain is not true. You really need to listen to your body, particularly as you start to get a little older. God knows 42 is not that old, but you start to think about the meniscus cartilage in the knee starting to wear a little bit, maybe some tendonitis or other problems like that. So this, these are signs if when you exercise it hurts, you should find out why. But how much pain? Because, you know, sometimes it's a pain that you know, all right, it's time to change your tennis shoes, and sometimes it's more than that. Well, I think you raise a good point, but it's time to do something. So if you're having pain, the first thing you do is stop. Maybe you take some ibuprofen or Aleve or something like that for a couple of days. You use a heating pad or some ice. If it goes away and if you can treat it yourself, like you say, you can change your shoes, uh, you can have your racket restrung if it's your tennis racket, and if you're feeling okay after that, then I would forget about it. But if you're having pain when you exercise and you're feeling it every time, it's time to start thinking about looking into it. And, you know, this day and age, that means going to see your doctor, whether it's your family doctor, your primary care doctor, or an orthopedic surgeon, to at least ask the question, what's causing it? Okay. Uh, here's another question. I have bone spurs, stiffness, and burning each day. Cortisone shots did not help last time. What would be my next step? Did that person happen to say how old he or she was? No, I don't have that. Fine. Well, you know, once again, as we're starting to deal with bone spurs and things like that, you're probably talking about a little older population, maybe somebody 50, 60 plus. Um, and if you're having bone spurs and you had cortisone shots, I think the person mentioned, cortisone is an anti-inflammatory. It's commonly used. We tend to use it a little more in older folks where the side effects aren't as serious, meaning in a young person you might not want to jump to cortisone because you're going to cover up a problem and maybe as they get older it's going to get worse. In an older person you might try some cortisone for its anti-inflammatory effect. If that's not working, then you probably have a more serious condition. And then the question is, you know, is it just bone spurs? Is that just, you know, a little aging? Or you have you have you now do you now have arthritis? 
And now you have to look a little further and start asking yourself, well, do I get on that pathway of really treating that and getting more serious about it? And I hate to keep going back to the same thing, but that means going to the doctor, asking the questions and saying, well, you know, is it okay for me to play tennis? Can I take a couple of ibuprofen and go out and play, or should I stop? Right. All right, here's another question for you. I am a 58-year-old overweight woman with chronic knee pain for two years. I had arthroscopic surgery to repair meniscus tears, which helped a little, but extended walking still causes pain and locking up in knee and hip. She says, I've recently lost 16 pounds, and my pain has lessened, and mobility has Im improved somewhat. I've been told that my knee joints are too pretty for knee replacement, despite the pain, and that I'm too young for knee replacement. Is makoplasty an option for me? As I'm still losing weight, should I see how my knees are after losing another 50 pounds? And we haven't talked about makoplasty yet, so maybe you want to start with that. Okay, so the makoplasty is really a robotic partial knee replacement. So we have a lot of things in our armamentarium. If you're a patient and you're facing a knee arthritis problem like this lady is, she's got pain in her knees, she's heavy, she's at an appropriate age 58 to start really thinking about arthritis, and it's starting to affect her. Now let me just give her a pat on the back because anyone who can lose weight that is such an important thing. Your weight is multiplied through the mechanics of your knee two or three times. So every pound you lose is like losing two or three. Every extra pound you have is like having two or three. So weight loss is great, and she should do exactly what she said, which is to lose, continue to lose weight, see how she feels. But what you asked me was about the makoplasty, the partial knee replacement, which is a half of a knee replacement. I'm going to grab a model just to give you an idea. This is a model of the bones of the knee. And this shows, I'm going to take it apart, we have a lot of different surfaces. Some of these surfaces have been covered with metal as they would be done in a replacement. But basically we have the inner, the outer, and the kneecap surfaces. In this case, one portion, the, the inner portion has been resurfaced. So this is, forget this piece for now, this is a partial knee replacement. We don't have to replace the whole thing which would be a total knee replacement. And the makoplasty is a way of doing this robotically and minimally invasively, where patients literally come in the hospital, they have their surgery, and they generally go home the next morning. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So then what happens? They go home the next morning, do they go back to what they were doing? Can they go back to the things they love? Well, you know, the range of options is, is very broad. So if you're a patient, you can, you can treat pain by ignoring it. You can treat pain by modifying the symptoms. So that's the cortisone shots. There's a gel shot. There's physical therapy. There's braces. You can use a cane. That's more or less living with it, but dealing with the symptoms. The next step is surgery. And there's basically three common surgeries that we see. Arthroscopic, which the, one of the patients mentioned, which is a clean out of the cartilage using a little telescope, two little cuts usually, and an outpatient surgery. The next more extreme surgery is the partial knee replacement, which I showed you, and the next is the total. Now if you ask surgeons, depending upon the condition of your joint, your weight, and the type of activities, you may or may not have to restrict yourself more or less. The advantage of a partial, and that's what we're talking about a lot today, knee replacement is you save all of your ligaments which hold your joint together and it functions pretty normally. So I'd hate to see a heavy person with a partial knee replacement out playing basketball or racquetball or jogging, but they can do a lot of things, bike, swim, walk, hike, things of that nature. And their knee generally, if it's successful, it feels pretty normal. How, how many people who come into you would be a good candidate for a partial? knee replacement? Well, that's a very good question. It depends a little bit on what your practice is like. My practice is basically mostly people with arthritis. But the typical patient for a partial knee replacement might be somebody a little younger than you would think of having a total knee replacement. Maybe they're in their late 40s, 50s. They've had an arthroscopic surgery and they know they have damage to their joint beyond just the meniscus cartilage. So it's gone into the point of arthritis, spurs, loss of cartilage, 
uh, bone exposed, bone on bone in small areas, but it hasn't spread to the remainder of their joint. So we're looking really for the healthy, active, middle-aged person. Okay. Um, I, I think we talked a little bit about this, but maybe we can go over this again. What are the options um, someone is asking for non-surgical treatments for my knee? And that's the first question everybody should ask, which is what do we do for this patient first? And, you know, a lot of my patients come in and they say, I'm here for a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And we always stop and say, well, wait a minute. What bothers you? You know, do you have bone on bone? Is it serious arthritis? But also, what have you tried? I had a patient scheduled for a makoplasty in about two weeks who came to me, referred by another doctor, and she was a very appropriate patient. But I said to her, have you tried physical therapy yet? She said, well, no, I haven't. I said, well, do me a favor. We'll put you on the schedule, but go try some physical therapy. And she came back two weeks later, or she called me two weeks later to cancel her surgery, which in my opinion was a win because she's only 30-some years old, and we'd like to hold off if we can. So the types of things we do are, and your doctor should be telling you this, physical therapy to strengthen the muscles and tendons around the joint, braces, supportive braces, some with hinges, some without hinges. You can try both. Uh, Anti-inflammatory medication, the common ones are Advil and Aleve, but there's also prescription ones. Uh, using a cane or a walking stick for those people who are so inclined, and generally people don't really like to use canes, but they really do work. So those are the main things that we do for patients who are contemplating surgery, but we tell them, look, give something else a try first, and many times you can give yourself years of relief and a happy life, continuing to run, continuing to play sports, but modifying your activities a little bit to control the pain. Okay. Uh, Dr. Starr, we just had a viewer uh, write in this question from Bucks County. What is the difference between a standard knee replacement and the makoplasty method? I think you covered this a little bit, but maybe you can tell us a little more. Right. So to go into more detail, total knee replacement is a procedure that's performed in this country approaching a million times a year. And it's the complete knee. So we, we, the femur and the tibia, which are the upper and lower leg bones, get completely resurfaced. So we put a metal piece on the top, a metal piece on the bottom, and a piece of plastic in between that acts like the meniscus cartilage. The metal basically smooths out the joint so it makes a smooth way to move. Most times we also resurface the kneecap. So the whole joint, there's no longer any parts of the joint that are touching. It's all been separated by plastic and metal. A makoplasty, a current makoplasty partial knee replacement attacks one of those areas. So if your arthritis is simply along the inner part of your knee joint where it touches the other knee, you can do a makoplasty, which is a robotic partial knee. Now you can do a partial knee replacement without the makoplasty, but the, exam the advantage of the robot is basically a smaller incision, less invasive, and you really get a very accurate reproduction of the surface of the joint. In all partial knee replacements, and I emphasize this with my patients, you save every ligament. So you don't, on a total knee, you're cutting ligaments to get the joint in, and the, the artificial joint has its own ligaments, if you will. In a makoplasty, you don't do that. So these patients really feel a lot more normal. Their knee functions like it's supposed to. I see. Uh, another question from Philadelphia. In your opinion, is it better to wait as long as possible before having knee replacement? If not, when is the best time considering the progress of osteoarthritis? Well, that's a great question. There's so many factors that you need to take into account to decide when to replace a knee. The first thing is all the extremes are not right. I don't know how many times I've been told by patients, I was told that I shouldn't have a knee replacement until I'm dying. Mm -hmm. You don't need to wait till then. What I find is that you really need to look at your activities. If you're having trouble going up the stairs, if you're not going to the shopping mall, if you like to do that because you can't walk, if you can't um, go and do the activities you want, maybe you want to play some doubles tennis or walk the golf course or go for a hike, you know, these are all the things that patients tell me. So I had a patient in the office the other day who was about 60 years old. And, you know, the questions, if you ask him the questions the right way, he would say to you, well, I can live with what I have. I have severe arthritis. It hurts me all the time, but I can manage. So the question I always ask is, well, what have you stopped doing? 
know, what are you no longer able to do? Well, I like to play tennis. I can't do that anymore. I like to go on hikes with my wife. I can't do that anymore. And so I say to the patient, the only thing I can tell you is what it's like to go through with the surgery and whether you have arthritis. What I can't tell you is when it's time. And the time is when it affects your quality of life. And for me, that might be tennis or golf. For somebody else, that might be just going from the bathroom to the, I'm sorry, the living room to the kitchen to get something to eat or walking into the bathroom. It depends where you are in your life and what you're interested in. So the answer is not the same for everybody. One thing that we, sh we do know, though, is for every patient who actually undergoes surgery, there's probably three or four or five other patients or people who don't have the surgery because they're afraid of it. And what these new options do is it gives us an opportunity to offer this to people in a less uh, nerve-wracking way, meaning we can be less invasive, we can get you on your feet more quickly. Instead of doing a complete knee, maybe we can do a partial knee in the appropriate set of circumstances. What do you tell patients who say, yeah, I'm afraid, of, you know, maybe this won't work? Well, I tell them they're totally normal. In fact, when a patient comes to me right before surgery to discuss the surgery and they tell me they're nervous, I tell them that makes me feel better because that means they're approaching it in a rational way because although these procedures are very safe, there's a small percentage of the time where things happen. You know, you are undergoing surgery. We try to make them as minimally invasive as we can. Most of the surgeries take less than an hour. We get you up right away. We get you in and out of the hospital in a day or two in many cases, even for total knees. But it is right to consider this carefully. It's a big step. But by the same token, you know, I had a 98-year-old lady come to me and want a knee replacement. And after conferencing with her three or four times and telling her that it was a crazy notion, she ultimately came with letters from all of her doctors saying, you know, she really can't get up out of a chair and she doesn't want to live her life like this. Mm -hmm. And she had her knee replaced, and I'm not recommending this for every 98-year-old person, mind you, but she lived for four years and she never was in a wheelchair again. So for her, it was the right decision at that time. So the answer to the question is, should you be fearful? Yes, that's a factor to consider, but, you know, the technology is better and we take good care of our patients, and most people do very well. That's a really interesting story because you really are saying quality of life is so important in, in deciding, in making this decision. Here's another question uh, from a viewer. It uh, says, I have read that strength training, specifically your hips, can reduce or eliminate knee pain. Is this true? And do you recommend any exercises specifically? What do you recommend against? Well, I think it becomes a question of the individual patient. Obviously, the times we get in trouble, for example, is when we try to do something that may not be appropriate to where we are. So if you have a 21-year-old person who is interested in going to the gym and pump iron and doing squats and things like that, you know, I would want them to do it in moderation and do it correctly and maybe have a trainer show them the right way, but that's very appropriate. And there's no question that people who keep themselves fit and toned feel better for a variety of reasons. They protect their joints better. But that becomes very age specific. So if you're a 65 year old person, maybe exercising by jogging and doing squats and heavy lifting may not be appropriate, but a spin class, using the elliptical, using captive type weight machines like circuit weight training may be very appropriate in moderation. You know, obviously the 15-year-old uh, football player gets away with an awful lot more than somebody in their 50s or 60s does. But I think there is a real role for exercise and fitness, and the two things are inextricably linked, which is weight reduction, being at a good weight, as well as keeping your muscles and tendons and ligaments fit. And it actually strengthens your bones, too. So I think that's critically important. Does that help with recovery, too? If you do surgery, I would think that if you're fit, it helps you. Yeah, we believe in something in orthopedics called pre-therapy. Now, pre-therapy is really something you should do every day. But pre-therapy, in our case, is someone's going to contemplate a knee replacement or a partial knee replacement. So we have them see a physical therapist in advance to try to get the kinks out, if you will. And they do better at knowing what to do after the surgery once they learn it before. By the same token, 
that's really something that it's it's kind of funny that we have to do that, but we really should be doing our therapy every day, whether we need a knee replacement or not. And I do think there's no question that fitness in reasonable moderation, not going going crazy and beating yourself up till you're tired and sore all the time, but fitness in reasonable moderation is going to protect your joints. And as you were mentioning, Luann, it's going to help protect you and get you ready for that joint replacement so you get better faster. Okay. Um, all right, this is a question that just came in from a 58-year-old woman, and she's asking about something, I, and forgive me if I mispronounce it, it says, when is synvisc appropriate? Do you know what she's talking about? Can you address the efficacy of gel shots for osteoarthritis? Yes, this is a very popular treatment. I mentioned the cortisone injections, which are anti-inflammatories. It's like taking super strong Advil but injecting it right into your joint. Mm. Um, that is generally a first-line treatment. Synvisc, because of insurance company reasons and availability and getting it approved, tends to be sort of a second-line treatment. And I shouldn't use Synvisc, which is a brand name. The chemical is hyaluronic acid, which comes from cartilage, many times made either from cartilage of chickens. It's extracted from the cartilage of chickens or else more recently, it's made through genetic engineering. So you can get different kinds. There's many brand names out there. I think the efficacy of all of them is about the same, but it's a gel injection. You give between one and five injections in the joint. It looks like clear mayonnaise. And you inject it in the joint usually once a week. There's a one-shot form. There's a five-shot form and a couple in between. And it's, it works. my experience is it works about 50% of the time. It seems to, the whole idea is to thicken the, fluid around the joint and lubricate it. It's a bit like putting uh, grease on a rusty hinge. Mm -hmm. Now the rear hinge is still rusty, so you know you keep moving the door, it eventually starts squeaking again. But for patients, if you can get six plus months relief from this, then it becomes a reasonable alternative to surgery or to other sorts of conservative treatment. Is this something that you would do then over and over again maybe, every six months to Yes. We, we offer it to patients as one of our options for therapy. As I mentioned, it's considered a second-line therapy because you, you generally try the other things first. But uh, the visco supplementation, as it's technically called, uh, is offered to patients. We do it once. If we get a great success, we are, it is actually insurance-approved and FDA-approved for every six months. So we have patients who come in every six months, every year. We don't hold it to six months. You can do nine months, ten months. And I have patients I've been doing this for for ten years. But wow. generally speaking, as the arthritis gets worse, you know, greasing the rusty hinge only is going to go so far, and you get to a certain point where it stops working. But it is a very reasonable treatment. Many people do it. Um, it's advertised a bit as something new. It's been around for more than ten years, and it's readily available. Maybe people are just learning about it, uh, though um, more people are doing it. Here's a question uh, from a viewer. I have been diagnosed with osteoarthritis on the inner portion of my right knee as well as under the kneecap. I also had meniscus surgery last fall. I'm hoping I can avoid full knee replacement surgery. surgery. Would I be a candidate for makoplasty? Yes and no. The makoplasty works best if you just have arthritis in that one spot along the inner part where the meniscus is. So if you, the perfect patient is a patient where nothing else hurts. Now if you have a little bit of arthritis behind the kneecap, you can leave that alone and figure that you know everybody might have a little bit if they're in their late 50s or early 60s or even early 50s. So it depends a little on the pattern of the pain. The more arthritis apart from the one area you're addressing, the more likely over time it's going to deteriorate and you may have to then go in and convert it to a total name. Now there is an option of doing a bicondylar or kneecap along with inner or outer knee part replacement. I think as you start to get to that point though, I question whether maybe you shouldn't just have a knee replacement. But, you know, that's, that's one of those sort of gray area situations. And I think that, you know, that's a real discussion with somebody who does a lot of this to get a sense of whether, you know, wh which group do you fit in with. And a lot depends upon your age. If I have somebody 72 years old who tells me that story, 
I'm going to tell them it's not worth doing a makeoplasty because a total knee is going to likely last them the rest of their life, 15, 20 years. If you have a mako, you run the risk that five, six, seven years down the road, the kneecap gets worse, and now you have to go back and do something else, which I don't think helps the patient. So there's a lot of factors in that. But I do think it's the great thing about this is it's all a discussion. It's elective surgery. It's weird surgery because unlike most things that doctors tell you, if you have high blood pressure, the doctor says take your medication. There's not a lot of choice. We sit around the room, and I, what I often say to my patients is there are three people sitting here. Maybe it's the patient, her husband, and myself. I say we each have a role. My job is to explain it to you so you understand it well enough to make an intelligent decision. Your husband's job is to support you and maybe push you a little bit to make the right decision, but you're the only one who can decide, and because it is truly elective. Right. Um, here's another question. I have a pothole in my left knee, but I am an avid runner, and I want to run again. I'm 70 years old. And I, ha I have run 70 marathons and been physically active all my life. I have been told I am a candidate for a partial knee replacement. How long will physical therapy take, and can I run again after surgery? That's a great question because it brings up about a 1,000 issues. <laughs> you know, a pothole in the knee means he's worn out a part of his knee, and that's actually the perfect patient we're looking for. So suppose he has an MRI and x-rays, which is what we often do, and it shows that the pothole is just located in one place. So that's really kind of a clear indication that a Mako would be appropriate. Now let's look at his age. A lot of 70-year-olds, I'm not going to recommend a Mako. It's an option, but you know they have to balance the longevity of the knee versus where they are in their life and what their activities are. Now the running thing, there's been numerous surveys of orthopedic surgeons that say, well, would you let somebody run or not run? And that's once again one of those gray areas. I would not recommend running on a total knee. Now I have a patient who runs one 5K a year on his total knee. And he says to me, look, doc, I'm going to do it. That's what I like to do. But I don't, I don't run to train for it. I use the elliptical. I use the bike. Most of the times he bikes. So probably for an occasional thing, it's not a horrible idea, but it makes me nervous. Whether a Mako partial knee replacement is going to be good in someone who does a lot of running or not, it's a little nerve wracking because if you break the cement that's holding that thing in there, you're going to have to go back in and redo it. So we don't know the answer to that, but with normal ligaments and with a good feeling knee that's kinematically, meaning mechanically normal after a makoplasty in many cases, certainly those patients tend to be very active. And I don't have anybody who admits to doing marathons on a partial knee replacement, but I've got a lot of tennis players and a lot of golfers and a lot of people out doing aggressive racquetball. I don't love these things, but you know when a person's 70, Maybe it's a time in your life where you say, all right, let me get it fixed and, you know, take a little chance. The person who I wouldn't let that do, and that's why I say there's a lot of factors, is a 50-year-old because we want to get the most years out of that possible. So they have to change more. The 70, 75, 80-year-old, you know, they come and say to me, well, can I ski? Can I run? Can I bike? I tell them, well, some of these things make me nervous, but, you know, maybe there's a time in your life where you say, go for it. Is, is, but I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. I just we just talk about it. Is there is it any better to run on a treadmill versus the hard cement? Make any difference to you in terms of saving a knee? Yeah. Yes. I, I think there's a difference. I mean, obviously, it's a bit like lifting free weights versus lifting weights on a circuit training. It's a more controlled environment. Most treadmills are a little padded now. You know, they have a little shock absorption. So, you know, we live in a world where if you're pounding on hard cement, you're more likely to injure yourself. And this is for a patient with or without an artificial joint. But if you're talking about arthritis and you want to prevent it, you know, being realistic and reasonable about the things you do make a lot of sense. And we know that the injury rates, for example, in the aggressive runners go up when you run more than 30 or 40 miles a week. So we know there's a toll to be paid by what you do. So I think mechanics and the environment where you run and exercise make a difference. And doing it right, you know, going to the trainer and making sure you're doing the right things. Uh, this is uh, interesting. We've got a question from a 25-year-old dancer and athlete. 
Uh, she says, what can I do to protect my knees and avoid surgery in the future? She's dancing. That's Well, dancers are real athletes. I mean, they are pounding on their legs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of things to be discussed with that. One of the things is is that is you need to look at yourself and see if you're biomechanically normal. You know, all of us that watch sports or play sports, you know there's people out there that are pulling muscles every day. You see people who are very awkward looking, maybe they're bow legged, really knock kneed, they're very loose jointed, we call that double jointed, you know, in common uh, use. And so people like that have to be a lot more careful. You know, is the dancer somebody who's injured themselves a lot because chronic injury is one of the things that leads, leads to arthritis. So if you're injuring yourself a lot, there's a message there. Are you warming up properly? Are you, are you exercising to the point where you're so exhausted that you can't protect yourself? I mean, in a 25-year-old, it's just, they're, they're so great at that age. You're really just telling them, watch your injuries, you know, learn from any injuries you have, don't overdo, don't get super tired, you know, don't try to run that extra five miles if you're hurting and you're sore. Uh, as you get older, you start to worry a little more about it. But also, if you're one of those people with flat feet, crooked legs, sore joints, double jointed, you probably need to be a little more careful. Okay. Um, here's another question. How can I deal with pain in my left knee that goes up my leg into my hip? When I sit for 20 minutes or more, it's very painful. Well, as physicians, we're always looking for where's the pain coming from. And today, even in the office, I had a patient come to me who said, well, you know, they told me they thought it was my back, and I had injections, and I had therapy. And then the, the uh, doctor who was doing the injections says, you know, I'm worried it could be your hip. Why don't we get an x-ray? And sure enough, we got an x-ray, and this poor lady who was being treated for a couple months with therapy and things that really are a good idea, Turned out she had a very bad hip, and she'll probably need a hip replacement at some point. Now, no harm was done to her, but it goes to show you that we have to figure out where the pain's coming from. So there's always three potential sources of pain when you're talking about in your leg. There's mechanical, so that's a hip or a knee joint, a bone itself, movement. There's neurological, so that's a pinched nerve, very commonly from the back, sciatica we call it. And then there's circulation, which, you know, we see a lot in older people or people who are diabetics where there's, their blood circulation is not good, and they can have pain from that. So the problem when somebody says they're having pain from their knee to their hip is trying to figure out which that is. And, yes, knee can come from the hip, hip can come from the knee. More commonly, pain down in the knee that's in the hip area is from the hip. But it can go both ways. And sometimes it's neither, and it's a pinched nerve in your back. So that's where really if you have consistent pain, somebody needs to help you sort that out, and that's your family doctor, your orthopedic surgeon, your neurosurgeon, your neurologist. There's a lot of people can help you. Okay. Uh, here's another question from a viewer. I have bone to bone, no cartilage on my left inside knee. What do you suggest for treatment? Well, this goes back to, and I think it's really pertinent to our initial conversation. The question is, what treatments have you had? So you have three options for treatment. Treatment one is to do nothing and say, all right, it's manageable. Even though the picture doesn't look nice, it's manageable. It doesn't hurt that much. Option number two is treat the symptoms. So somebody like that should certainly start physical therapy, maybe have an injection, maybe wear a brace. It depends what sort of activities they like to do, and that's a very important question. And if they're at an appropriate age and weight and in good health, the third option is some sort of a surgical procedure. Now, very important, arthroscopic surgery, which is the little telescope procedures that everybody wants, will not work for somebody who's bone on bone. With arthroscopic, you can only take tissue out. So if you've already lost your cartilage, going in there and cleaning it out isn't going to help. That was something we tried for years. It tends to make the arthritis worse, so it's not recommended. So the surgical options in those cases are partial or total knee replacement. And once again, it depends upon your age, your weight, depends upon where the arthritis is, and how long you want it to last. Okay, doctor, this is a very specific case. So stand by here. It's, it's a little bit of a story. This is uh, from a viewer who says, I'm a very active 60-year-old woman who works, plays, 
tennis three times a week and does yoga a couple times a week. Last spring, my right knee became sore and swollen, and x-rays revealed arthritis. And an MRI revealed a small, torn lateral meniscus and a ruptured Baker's cyst. She says, uh, I was told my left knee had more arthritis, but I have no problems with that knee. I had two cortisone injections on my right knee, which have really uh, done nothing. So she says that hasn't helped. My knee has gotten progressively worse. And she says it's one and a half times larger than the other knee. Um, she says, I truly believe that was small, uh, that what was small is no longer. And that she sustained a medial tear. She'd appreciate your opinion, as I am not ready to give up my active lifestyle just yet. Well, we don't want her to give up her active lifestyle. I mean, the whole thing about this is maintaining function and activity within what the patient wants to do. So that's a great case because I believe she, she was about 60 years old. She's active. She's uh, already got some pathology. She's had MRI. She's had x-rays, although we don't know how recent they are. And she has some pathology. She has some damage to her knee. The problem is how much arthritis there is. If there's not much arthritis, and there's a meniscal tear, cartilage tear, and she's having symptoms of it catching or popping, that can be a reason for it to swell. Now, all of the things she's mentioned, the knee's bigger and there's a Baker cyst, just mean there's fluid collecting around the knee. The Baker cyst's in the back of the knee, the fluid's in the front of the knee, the fluid's really getting in and out of the back and the front of the knee. It all comes from the arthritis and from the tears. So what we need to do is evaluate how much it's bothering her. It's disappointing that the cortisone, which is a great anti-inflammatory, isn't working. So the first question I would have is, how much mechanical symptoms is she having? Is the cartilage really the problem? Is it just catching or getting stuck? If that's the case and there's not too much arthritis, she might be a candidate for an arthroscopic. If, on the other hand, it's just arthritic, then I would go through the whole protocol because she's young and wants to be active. So, you know, brace, take the fluid out, physical therapy, you know, take some time off, use anti-inflammatories. If that doesn't work, then we look at what we can do surgical repair-wise. And as long as her activity levels are moderate, maybe doubles tennis, bowling, uh, walking, hiking, biking, swimming, those are fine. And we don't want her to stop being active. We mentioned the marathon runner before. You know, one of the things is you have to manage transitions in your life. So as you get older, you, things you might have been able to do before, you can't anymore. We don't want to force people into that. But sometimes your body's giving you a message. So in this case, I think this woman's activities are fine for a person her stated age. Maybe for the marathon runner, they should get their knee fixed and join a biking club. You know, and get the camaraderie with the biking and the exercise but you know just look for another way to get an outlet because there are points at which we can't give everybody exactly what they want although we certainly do try right uh, this is a question from Doylestown uh, they're asking is there one sport or activity that seems to lead to the most patients is that running or is it something else now it's it's not it's different in every patient because it depends how much they do it and to what intensity are they heavy are they thin High impact is always going to damage your knee more. Twisting, a lot of twisting, getting hit, so soccer, basketball, things where you're up and down are going to damage your knees. Uh, a lot of running over a long period of time. But, you know, the injury risk is not quite the same. And once again, if you're staying to a more reasonable length, you know, I have people who say to me, I still run, and they're a little on the older side, but then I say, how much? Well, I run two miles three times a week. You know, the injury risk there is low as long as they're not very obese, as long as they don't have very uh, angular knees, very much out of alignment and have a lot of other problems, or that they don't already have arthritis. So, you know, a lot of it is, to be honest with you, is common sense, and it's not beating yourself up. The one thing about your body, that other patient mentioned the swelling. Swelling's a sign. If you have fluid in your knee after activity, something's going on. And I'd ask the question why that is. Maybe it's just a touch of arthritis. But if you're getting fluid after activities, you probably have some damage. From Deptford, New Jersey, a question, again, uh, going back to something we've touched on. What determines if, uh, if you can get away with a partial versus the full knee replacement? Well, the partial knee replacement is only going to fix the one area. 
So what you, what you have to accept by having a partial knee replacement is that the pain is predominantly in the one area, usually on the inner portion of your knee. If you have a lot of other arthritis, it makes me a little concerned. If you have a little bit of other arthritis, but it's not, not painful, you might consider it. But you know, it's a relative thing. One of the things about the Mako that I want to explain a little bit, though, is it's a very different technology. We've been doing partial knee replacements for many years. At Abington, we started in 2001, and we just did it in the conventional way, made a cut, opened things up, used our rulers and devices, and we would put in the replacement. And actually, I showed the <laughs> replacement before, but, you know, this is the, re ignore this for the moment, but this is the replacement, the metal top and the metal and plastic bottom, and it moves you know, very nicely the way it's supposed to. Well, um, when you put in a makoplasty, now, instead of using our rulers and making a big cut and trying to get it exact, we have a much more exact way to do this. So this is with computer guidance. So we do a CAT scan first. We put all that information into the computer, and then we pick the sizes and the position and the shape to match the rest of your knee. So the big advantage of that is that it works much better with the rest of your knee, in my opinion, than the older partial knee replacements. So what that means for the person who's trying to decide whether to have a makoplasty or a partial knee replacement is that they can expect a little better outcome and we can get them back on their feet more quickly and maybe they would be able to be a little more active. So I think it figures into that whole mix of how you decide who needs it and whether they decide it's the right thing for them. Doctor, I have a 65-year-old in Philadelphia asking about blood loss during a partial or full knee replacement. Is that something to consider? Are you dealing with blood loss? Yes. You know, any surgery you do, there's bleeding. Um, because the technology for all these procedures now is becoming less invasive and, and quicker, really, if you're doing the surgeries in under an hour, there's less time to bleed. We also use tourniquets. It's a blood pressure cuff that we wrap around the thigh and we stop the bleeding into the, uh, the joint area while we're doing the surgery for about maybe half an hour. Uh, but blood loss is an issue. The average patient's blood count drops a moderate amount in the couple of days after their surgery. There's a certain amount of oozing internally. The uh, blood transfusion rate for a healthy person is very low. And we have some fancy technology that we use. We have some, there's a, a, a chemical called tranexamic acid that we use in a lot of our replacements, which prevents bleeding. We have a lot of other surgical technology without getting too gory about it that helps with the bleeding. So the vast majority do not require a blood transfusion unless the person starts out anemic or they have some reason that it's dangerous to let their blood count drop. So we can tolerate a certain amount of blood loss, but if you have, for example, bad cardiac disease or you start out very anemic, you have a greater chance of requiring a blood transfusion. In a makoplasty, though, because it's such a limited surgery, the likelihood of a blood transfusion is exceedingly low as compared to a total knee where it's low but not quite as, not quite as low. Uh, another question about makoplasty uh, from a viewer. I'm only 38 years old with osteoarthritis and have been told I need double knee replacement, but they're saying they won't perform it. Why wouldn't they perform that? Well, the historical knee replacements have lasted in the range of 15 or 20 years, occasionally longer. So you have patients, when they're very young, having replacements, you just have to do the arithmetic. If that person lives for 40-plus years, they're going to need three or four knee replacements. By the time you get to the third or fourth one, they're not working so well because you run out of bone. It's like when the uh, screws get loose in the hinges and you put toothpicks in. We can only put in so many toothpicks. Uh, for them, a more conservative approach is potentially a partial knee replacement where you're removing less bone. So it can be a first operation for somebody who has the appropriate amount of arthritis. But I will tell you, we do pause. Not that we don't do surgery in people in their 30s, because we do, but we do pause and look very carefully at those patients, their lifestyle, their weight. You know, if they're a construction worker, it's not going to be a good idea. If they work at a desk, if they're thin, if they're willing to stay thin, you might consider it. 
but I will tell you it's it's a bit extreme not out of the question but really a very last resort for somebody who's much younger and a person in their 30s is very young my youngest replacement patient's 21 but you know that's an extreme circumstance and the average age of patient having a total knee right now is about 63 or 64 it's gotten a lot younger as people have expected higher levels of function through their lives the average age of a Mako patient is probably 10 or 10 or 12 years younger than that mm -hmm. so uh, a 70 year old viewer is saying uh, they are very active tennis golf biking skiing um, they say I've had arthroscopic on my meniscus and cortisone injections I'm told that partial knee replacement is indicated when I'm ready they're very concerned about the recovery time. They say activity is their life. What would you tell them? Well, fortunately, they were born at the right time because the technology has gotten so much better. A partial knee replacement 20 years ago was a big incision, cut the whole knee open, spend a long time putting it in in a mechanical way without the robot that we have now, which gets things aligned with the computer virtually perfectly. And so the recovery was a long time. It was, you know, six, eight weeks of being careful. I did one of these partial knee makoplasties on Monday, and the patient left the hospital the next day. That's pretty normal. With Walking the, the next day. Yes. Walking. Next day. And how soon, though, could they go back to doing some things? Well, I think... You know, walking around, driving, going out within a matter of days to maybe a week or two. As far as something very aggressive, you know, the interesting things like golf, for example, or playing racquetball or a lot of twisting. So I'd want to make sure that the tendons and everything around there which are inflamed from the surgery are a lot better. So, you know, you're looking at probably by around the six-week time frame you could get pretty aggressive. But remember, if you can have a surgical procedure like this and be up and walking the same day and home and going out and walking around and visiting people, you know, people want to live their lives. They want to go and go to their kids' weddings. They want to go out to dinner. And a lot of times we started out with a lot of these limited invasive procedures in the very young patients, thinking, well, they have to get back to their lives. And I had an interesting experience with a particular kind of uh, very – minimally invasive hip replacement that I did because I was only doing it in my youngest patients and several of my older long-time patients came in and said but wait a minute I want to get back to my life too so we're really all about now getting people up quickly getting them moving and I would say nine patients out of ten should be up and back to their lives within a week or two maybe with some limitations being a little careful you know, there is a certain health aspect to this, and some people don't react quite as quickly as others, but people get going quickly now, and so I wouldn't be overly concerned. I mean, that's really amazing. I can't think of that many surgeries where you're up and, you know, walking the next day and, and then back to a lot of your normal activities in a couple of weeks. It's pretty well, amazing. Rapid, reco rapid recovery is really what is the buzzword in joint replacements now because what we realize is it's convenient for the surgeons and the patients, but the other part of it is, you know, we used to worry a lot about blood clots and pneumonia, and not that we don't still see those things, but if you're in a rapid recovery program, which a lot of the good places that do a lot of joint replacements are doing, you have a dedicated team who's getting you up and moving, Honestly, we, we kind of don't say no for an answer, so we really get people moving quickly. But that means that you're going to get your body functioning normally much more quickly, and hopefully you're not going to have those problems and complications. So not only is it nice for the patient to get back to their lives, but it's also safer for them. Uh, we have a question uh, about uh, from a viewer saying, my right knee meniscus was torn but treated a few years ago. The pain has returned. Could this be caused by arthritis? Yes. The guess that you would have, depending upon the age, I mean, if that's a 20-year-old kid who tore his meniscus playing uh, football, the likelihood it's not arthritis, it's a re-tear, it's a, you know, an, a loose piece in there, or, you know, a scuff of the surface of the cartilage. If it's a, you know, somebody like me in their mid-50s, you're likely looking at, well, you had a tear. It was probably a degenerative tear, meaning it didn't tear from playing football. It just kind of wore out, 
and other parts are wearing out along with it. It doesn't sound nice, but there's no doubt that the arthroscopic treatments, which work to a degree in the middle age to older population who has a true tear without arthritis, often can be followed by some arthritis just in the natural, it's not from the arthroscopic, it's just the natural evolution that led them to tear their meniscus in the first place. Once again, I want to be very clear. You know, the 20, 25-year-old who tears their cartilage and has a meniscectomy arthroscopically is probably going to do pretty well, and if they have a, a repeat injury or a repeat problem, may well be able to have it treated as successfully. But as you get into that older age group, 50s, 60s, 70s, it's a whole different ball game, and they're more likely looking at some arthritis developing, which means the bone's getting involved, the cartilage is being lost from the surface of the bone. It's a much more global problem rather than just a little spot. Right. Another question. Uh, I have a calcium deposit on my right knee that has grown bigger over the years. Is there a possible knee surgery for this? Well, there's different kinds of calcium deposits. You know, your bones are made of calcium, so calcium is normal in your body. You can have calcium in your knee joint within the joint itself. So it's, we call it a joint mouse or loose body. It kind of rolls around in there. I've had patients who've had hundreds of these things, and then you have patients who may have one or two, and as they move, it gets stuck. So that sort of calcium deposit is easily treated by my arthroscopic colleagues, the sports medicine colleagues, and they take those little pieces out of there, and that stops the problem. Maybe there's a little arthritis, but it's still successful because you get out the catching. The, um, the, you can also have calcium deposits from injury around the muscles and tendons, and some you're actually born with. And those can be removed, but it's a totally different operation. You really have to cut into where the muscle is and take those out. There are times when you do that. If it's, if it's just a picture on an x-ray, then leave it alone. If it's not, if it's in the way, then you want to take that out and let that muscle function more uh, smoothly. But that's a bigger surgery. That's an open surgery where you, know, you have to give the muscle time to heal, and you know, it's going to be a little longer run. You were saying at a certain point you've just got to go see your doctor. So let's say you've got constant knee pain, it's interfering with your life. You, you find a doctor, how should that conversation go? Well, you want to know, you want to have a good relationship with a doctor. And you know, patients sometimes are embarrassed to say, well, I saw Dr. X and you know, it, I didn't like him or I, it was something about him. What I would tell you is you're going to be working with this person and have to rely upon them. So make sure that their approach works for you. Some patients love the doctor who just tells them what to do. By the way, I drive those people crazy because I always give options, particularly because I'm in an elective environment. Other people like the doctor who says, well, let's look at what's out there and let's go through all the options. I think a reasonable doctor should spend the time to know what you've done, how much it's affecting you, and then give you the range of options, even if they throw out a few of them, even if they say, well, you know, arthroscopic is an option, but I don't like it because you've already got arthritis, and I don't think it makes sense for you. So I think, you know, you have to have some common sense, but also don't be afraid to pick a doctor who you like because of their approach, not because you like them because you want to go out and have a drink with him or her, but because you like the way they approach it, and they can work with you in a way that makes sense. And if they listen to you and they give you options, then I think you're in the right place. All right, Dr. Starr, we're about to wrap up. What are the key takeaways that you would like our viewers to leave with tonight? Well, I think there's a few simple messages. You know, the first message is be your own advocate. If something hurts, if something's bothering you and it's consistent, you know, I'm not talking about, hey, I played you know, soccer for the first time on the weekend and I'm 50 years old and my legs are sore and you expect that and it goes away after a few days. But if, it, if things are stopping you from doing what you want to do, talk to your primary doctor, talk to a specialist like an orthopedic surgeon and get some idea of what the problem is. The other thing is though, all of medicine now is moving in the direction of less invasive, higher technology, to make these procedures when you need them, and you, I hope you never need one, but when you need them, more accurate, more successful, you know, and we just, as physicians and patients, we just don't want surprises anymore. So having this higher technology, having higher success rates, being able to get people up and moving more, 
gives you an option so you don't have to be quite so concerned about it. So I think those are my two messages. Be your own advocate and trust that technology is going to help us to get better answers and better solutions as we go forward in the future. Dr. Andrew Starr, thank you so much. With Abington Health, thank you for joining us tonight and answering all of our viewers' questions. I'd like to tell you now about our next health chat. It's on Monday, May 4th at 6 p.m. with Dr. Mara Thur. She's an OBGYN with Abington Health, and she's going to be answering your questions about getting pregnant after age 35. And you can sign up and ask your questions ahead of time, just like you did for this chat, by registering on www.abingtonhealth.org slash healthchats. On behalf of Abington Health and Philadelphia Magazine, I want to thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.